Coming up today on the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast, Trent and Biz with you as we break down Iowa's win over Wisconsin, and one that Biz calls the most perfect win of the year. We'll break that down and talk about Iowa's domination over one of the most unlikable figures in college sports, that is Phil Fleck. We'll break that down along with look at the Minnesota matchup and, of course, our picks of the week presented by Bet Online. That's all today on Locked On Hawkeyes. Our Locked On Hawkeyes, your daily podcast on the Iowa Hawkeyes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Trent Condon. That's my good buddy, Biz, longtime friend, and we are here on the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Thanks for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen each and every day, available wherever you get podcasts. You can also see us on YouTube, and it, while you're there, hit that subscribe button. It helps us get in front of more Hawkeye fans. Biz, Iowa gets it done 24-10 over Wisconsin, a cold day in Kinnick Stadium. You were there. Unfortunately, I was not, but boy, watching on television, the sound, Felt like a good one, a fun one over there in Iowa City, the victory, and a pretty good environment in Kinnick Stadium. Yeah, it was a, it was a great environment and a great great win. I mean, at this point in time, you know Iowa's wins are not going to be pretty. Uh, you know, you take them when you, when you can get them. And, and like, I, like you said on the uh, opener there, pretty much a perfect win for this Iowa football season. It pretty much uh, encapsulated Iowa football to a T. You know, bad offense, but, man, everything else – you, you can't get much better from a defense and special team standpoint than what you saw on Saturday. And, you know, to me, the thing that I loved, that was the first time I can remember in at least a decade that we were able to just legitimately control the line of scrimmage from a defensive standpoint. I mean, mm -hmm. Braylon Allen had absolutely nowhere to run. And that was, you know, that, that just doesn't happen against Wisconsin lines. So, you know, uh, part, part of that Wisconsin line is not as good as, as usual, but man, I, Huge, huge credit to Iowa's defensive line. They, they put up a, a, an unbelievable performance on Saturday. You know, I've had this thought and kind of watching it all play out. And as you're, you're coasting into the victory, get up 14 and it just, uh, all right, this thing's over. And it jumped into my mind that we're so used to having now great Iowa defenses, you know, how good they are, how special this group is. And what they've gone through this year with injuries, with, you know, what happened starting with Justin Jacobs, a guy that could allow them to play a couple of different ways. I mean, how important he would be during this stretch right now when you're playing a team like Wisconsin, having an extra linebacker out there and, and having a guy that can play at such a high level, losing him, losing Terry Roberts, uh, Jamari Harris, just on and on and on. They, they have, they've lost some big pieces to this defense, and yet they continue to go out there week after week and play at such a high level and do it in a couple of different ways. And it doesn't matter what kind of team they're going up against, just the the domination that they're playing at. I think we're so spoiled with Phil Parker's defense that maybe we just kind of forget just how good, A, we have it. And secondly, this defense individually, this year, the 2022 defense, just how good it is. Well, I mean, we'll wait and see how the next two weeks play out, Trent. But right now, I mean, what they're averaging, what, 3.8 yards a play, which is the lowest of any team since 2011, Alabama. I mean, that's, that's – <laughs> It's pretty impressive. Yeah. And, you know, what, what strikes me about this defense, you know, let, let's wait to the end of the year before we, we determine where they are in, you know, Hawkeye history, or at least our history. But uh, the thing that I think this sets this defense apart from some of the other Iowa defenses is just the depth. Mm -hmm. I mean, the defensive line depth, the linebacker depth. I mean, like you said, you know, years past when we've had to go to backup linebackers, you know, 09 was a perfect year. A perfect example of that. We had a great D line, but we got hurt, and James Morris had to come in and play early, and a few other options, and Hitchens and guys like that that ended up being great linebackers, but they just weren't ready to play that early. Um, you know, it's this year you've just seen the depth. The Jay Higgins have come in, and we really haven't, haven't missed a beat. And D line, I mean, you can make an argument that the backup D line is just as good or, or better than the, the, the starting D line. I mean, yeah. When you put in that that backup five, you put in Craig and, and Van Ness and, hell, even Ethan Herkett. That guy, That's... he makes the most of his 10 to 15 snaps a game. You know, he's – every single game he's making a play or two in the backfield. And, you know, it's it's pretty impressive to see because that's the one thing that 
you know, I think used to be the major difference between Iowa's defenses and the, you know, the SEC defenses is just depth, but we have, uh, We've closed the gap in that area. The, the depth of our defense across the board is, is really, really impressive. Today's episode of the Lockdown Hawkeyes podcast brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Biz, a little bit later on, we'll make our picks presented by Bet Online, as good as bad as they may be. And Maybe people can bait us and, and make some money that way because it hasn't been a pretty season for us overall. Uh, back to the defense and Cooper DeGene. We saw this guy. I remember us sending uh, the highlight tapes from basketball in our text group together, and we're just we're laughing. We, we also played two-way basketball and uh, varying levels of success. You're a little more successful than me, but we played two-way basketball. Tell you, we didn't see many people in the North Iowa Conference drop step dunking on people, and and you see it play out now on the football field. He is just an incredible athlete. He is the embodiment of an Iowa football player and, and that ridiculous athleticism that he has. And the dude's only been co- playing cornerback for a year. I mean, he played at every other position growing up. And But until last year, late in the season, when injuries hit the Iowa defense, he had never played cornerback before. And now, statistically, Pro Football Focus has him rated as the top slot corner in the country. This dude, I, I just... You run out of superlatives to talk about when you're talking about Cooper DeGene. Well, you're correct. There's the, there's the cool videos of him dunking and things like that. But let's be honest. What what uh, what college cornerback can't dunk? I mean, the athleticism is not what sets Cooper DeGene apart. I mean, yeah, he's athletic, but but that you know, fair or not fair, that athleticism is well known because he's a white cornerback. I mean, that that not what you expect out of it, but. His football IQ is just through the roof as well. I mean, just you watch him just with those punt returns. I mean, it, it's just he makes it look so damn easy. I mean, he's just yeah. kind of floats out there and he just, you know, no panic defensively, the same thing. I mean, you know, they made a comment at the end of the game, you know, it's not easy to do all the different jobs he's being asked to do. I mean, punt returns, not an easy job. Uh, being on the, the gunner on the punt team's not an easy job to be able to do those types of things. And he just makes all of it look so simple. I mean, it's just, you know, he's, I think everybody, all Iowa fans thought he was going to be a productive member of this team, but anybody that tells you they thought he was going to be this is, is full of themselves. I mean, he's, I mean, what he's done in, in the last, I mean, he should be, he probably won't be, but he should be the big 10 defensive back of the year. I mean, he's, and as a true sophomore, I don't, know, I don't have the info in front of me, but I'm guessing there's never been a true sophomore who's been the Big Ten defensive back of the year. I mean, he's he's light years better than I ever thought he'd be. I thought he'd be a good, productive member of Iowa football, but not this. I mean, he's pretty amazing. thought he was going to be another Tommy Sewing, but you put him back at safety, and you know what's going to happen. He'll be a free safety, and he'll be back there making plays, and he'll be like Quinn Schulte has been. Uh, he is so much more than that, and excited to see still at least another season in front of him in a Hawkeye uniform. Well, as good as the defense was, the offense certainly had their problems, yet they got the ball in plus territory a couple of times after the block punt from Craig, and they went down and scored, and they scored out field goals. They scored touchdowns here. It's little things, and that's what we're looking at with this Hawkeye offense, and the offensive line obviously struggled mightily in the game, but made a couple of plays when they needed to, and, and that was enough to beat Wisconsin. Well, for the third week in a row, Trent, you got to give a tip of the ball cap to Spencer Petrus. I mean, mm-hmm. was that a pretty effort by him? Absolutely not. But the one thing you have to agree, whether you like him, hate him, whatever, you have to agree, he is one tough dude. I mean, he got destroyed on Saturday. I mean, he was getting hit early and often, and other than the early fumble, he did a heck of a job of, you know, he didn't make mistakes. He never panicked. He certainly outplayed Graham Mertz. I mean, which isn't saying much, but, but uh, I mean, he just kept fighting. He, you never saw any panic. That's the big thing I was worried about at that Ohio State game is he just looked, had that deer in the headlights look, which, you know, that's hard to come back from. And even you know, going back to the, the opener, South Dakota State, he looked like he had deer in the headlights that game also. I, uh, you got to give the kid credit because he's kept battling and you know he did what he needed to do to get us a win on 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 Saturday cuz I said it before the game and I said it a million times during the game it was going to come down to which quarterback screwed up and Graham Mertz did it and that's yep. i mean 
did Petrus win us the game? No, but he definitely didn't lose us the game either. And that, and that was his that was his assignment going in, and he he, uh, he he passed that assignment. So give the kid credit. He's a tough kid. He battled, and uh, you know, he, he's he came out a winner. So that, that's about all you can ask for for Iowa football right now because it, it ain't going to be pretty. But if you can if you can scratch out W's, uh, you know, tip of the cap to him. Uh, might not be pretty this weekend, but a matchup against Minnesota as we continue here on the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. We will break things down and take a look back at Kirk Ferentz, well, leaving the taking the pig and leaving the timeouts behind. He likes to rub it in the nose of P.J. Fleck just a little bit. We'll break down the matchup with Minnesota as we continue here. This is the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Today's podcast brought to Nissan, our friends at Nissan, uh, with our thrilling moments throughout the year. This week's thrilling mo- moment in college football brought to you by Nissan, the thrilling designs behind the new lineup of Nissan intended to empower drivers as vehicles as capable as the drivers themselves. When I think of unbelievable abilities on the field this week, our thrilling moment, biz, it has to be Cooper DeGene, right? The pick six, I mean, that play absolutely, completely changed the complexion of that football game. Yeah, I was up 7-3 to three there, but that pick six really flipped the game on its head. I know Wisconsin scored in the late half, but has to be that play for me. What do you think? Yeah, it's either that or, or the ultimate Iowa play, thrilling play, which would be the punt down to the one-yard line because yes. that, that was huge also. It flipped field position and got, it ultimately got us our third score as well because uh, yeah. once we got up by more than a touchdown that game, in the second half, that game was over. I mean, we, we, we could just uh, – you know, you know, put 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 it neutral at that point. But yeah, I, I think it's pretty hard to argue against the pick six. Anytime you have a pick six, that's probably your whatever you call it, your Nissan thriller of the game. Trent. You got it. This segment inspired by the thrilling new designs featured across Nissan's new lineup of vehicles. Pursue what thrills you in the all-new Frontier, Armada, or Pathfinder today. Available now at NissanUSA.com. Trent and Biz back with you as we continue on the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Thanks for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen each and every day. For your second listen, don't forget about Locked On Sports Today. From the games that matter the most to the biggest stories in sports, go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights only Locked On can provide. Locked On Sports Today, available on this app, YouTube, or wherever you get podcasts. You ready to talk about Phil Fleck and the Gophers, Biz? No, I'm ready to talk about Floyd of Rosedale first. <laughs> okay, all right. We'll, we'll talk Gophers first, but to loyal listeners know that, that the, the the real brains behind this operation is Stat Boy, and and we okay. haven't uh, we we haven't we haven't given Stat Boy a good good assignment to dig his teeth into in, in, in a few weeks. So I figured uh, nobody loves the, the Iowa Minnesota rivalry more, more than Stat Boy. He he loves the. For whatever reason, he loves the "We Hate Iowa" chant. He likes to chant yes, he it does. himself. He's he's a bit of an odd duck, but but he also loves the Florida Rosedale, as we all do. But so I, I gave him a simple assignment. Let, let's everybody knows the general history of Florida Rosedale, but let, let's dig into it. You, do you know the the full history, Trent? Because it's pretty good. Yeah, it, it's something with uh, the governors getting together. There was some back and forth between Iowa and Minnesota. Fill in the details. Yeah, so it all came together and literally like it, it, it's. Remember, as I go through this, this all happened in like one week time because it was a, a crazy time in, in, in 1935, Trent. And, you know, you, you love Statboy has his newspapers.com subscription, so you can always find great stuff. But there's some great comments in, in the newspapers because, you know, newspaper writers in 1935, they, they loved it, loved the, the flair for the dramatic. So, so November 1935, you got to go back to the year before 1934. The Gophers had, had stomped Iowa, and there was some anger over some alleged dirty play by the Gophers. Um, Iowa's running back with named Ozzie Simmons, African American, mm-hmm. and the only African American I believe in the Big Ten at the time. And there was some comments that the Gophers may have been uh, a little over the line the year before. So the week leading up to the game, there were some threats that the game actually was not going to happen. That, that Minnesota was not going to play in it. Iowa was not going to play in it. Both sides kind of threatened and said. We're worried. At one point, the Iowa governor commented something about if the officials don't take care of it, I'm sure the Iowa fans will come out of the stands and handle it themselves. So, so uh, tempers were flaring. So, literally, the day before the game, November 8th, they calm things down. The governors make a wager for basically a, a prize pig. The, 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 uh, 
the loser of the game has to deliver a prized pig from their state to the other governor. So, so there, there's your bet. But uh, unfortunately, the Gophers win. And the next Tuesday, I believe it was, the Iowa governor delivers Floyd to the state of, of Minnesota. But it was clear that uh, Floyd himself was not what, what Minnesota considered to be a prize pig. So I'll just read it to you. This was the opening line of the St. Paul paper. Like a fallen emperor paying fealty to his conqueror, Governor Herring of Iowa tendered to Governor Olson a lowly grunting hog as the stake of the football wager. It goes on to talk about how unimpressed they were with Floyd and felt that Iowa was, was not giving them one of their prized pigs. They, they described it as an underfed, razor-backed, scrawny, frail animal inferior to even the poorest porker in the Minnesota Plains. So uh, <laughs> very dramatic. Trend. This is uh, this is front page, uh, literally front page news that the, the, the pig was not up to standard. So uh, Minnesota decides, well, we'll take we'll take the, the scrawny, frail, in, inferior animal. So they take it and decide that they're just going to award Floyd as a prize to a winner of an ongoing local youth farm writing contest. So that fires up Iowa and they decide, well, we want the pig back. So the next day, in an attempt to get the pig back, an attorney in Iowa files a lawsuit. <laughs> files a lawsuit. And, and, Sounds like something you would do, Biz. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah why not? <laughs> so they, they filed the law. basis of the lawsuit is that they claim that both governors were engaged in illegal gambling. That this was an illegal gambling charge. And <laughs> Sounds they, like they, you again. Yeah, why not? And they demand part of the, the claims are is that they, they want the governor of Minnesota thrown in jail, but really they want the return of Floyd. Uh, literally the next day the case is set for hearing. And this is front page news like every day. The <laughs> next day it's set for hearing, but the case ends out that goes in front of a, a, a series of judges. And one of the judges, stat boy really enjoyed this. One of the judges' last name was Cooter. So so Judge Cooter makes the decision to dismiss the case. Uh, this sends the, the attorney turned by last name a case that brought it into a tirade and he claims that his business is removing crooks from office and that was the reason he was doing this was to remove remove the crook from office for, <laughs> for having the audacity to gamble on the pig so all this happened in literally five days time the, the wager happens november 8th the game happens november 9th the suit gets filed november 12th and the charges get dropped by november 13th so uh yeah, th this is a, a major, major news story every day, front page on uh, what was going on with Floyd. So uh, the sad, sad ending to all this, Trent, and bringing us to uh, the fact that nothing's changed in, in 85 years of time, things ended poorly for, for the real live Floyd that was given. Uh, he ended out, uh, they did not give him as a, as a prize in this contest. They ended up just keeping him, and he was raised on a farm in Minnesota, but Less than a year later, he passed away. And the reason he passed away is they had refused to get him vaccinated. Oh, so, uh, wow. like I said, something's never changed. They refused <laughs> to get him vaccinated, and he died of cholera, which, if you remember your Oregon Trail days, I believe that was one of the ways you would die in the the, the game of Oregon Trail. Is, uh, I think it was dysentery and cholera were the, the, yes. the common, common deaths. So, so he died of cholera, didn't make it to the next year, so they had to make a bronze pig. So that's how you get to the bronze pig and how we get to Floyd of Rosedale. But uh, the original plan was Floyd was going to get passed back and forth. He was the, the live pig was up for up for it the next year until he died of cholera. So so there's your Floyd of Rosedale history. That so is wonderful. Yeah, the great work out of Stat Boy this yeah. week. A, a lot of fun twists and turns in there. And, and you know, he was just giggling as he was writing down his notes going through newspapers.com and getting that oh, all. The amount of pay, the amount of newspaper I had to dig through it. He sent me probably 60 pages of newspaper. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, so good. So good. All right. So we got the history now of Floyd. It's a great trophy. If you haven't been by the it, best you know, trophy to the best, the, the best. Yes. The state fair. It's just, it's awesome. It is. Now we grew up in North central Iowa. This is the biggest rivalry game for me. It's not Iowa state. It's not Nebraska. It's not Wisconsin, Illinois. It is this one for me. Have family in Minneapolis used to go to this game quite a bit as a kid, go out to the Metrodome. We've been there plenty of times in the past when we got a little bit older and maybe over imbibed a time or two up in Minnesota. 
it's a great time. Uh, the, the rivalry is fun. The who hates Iowa, we hate Iowa chant. It, it's kind of a term of endearment. At least that's the way that I look at it. I don't think I'm alone amongst Hawkeye fans when you hear it. But here recently, it's been a lot of fun too because we've been winning this game. You know, I can remember plenty of times. In fact, my first ever Iowa-Minnesota game up there, Iowa had to win to get to the Copper Bowl. And they lost to Minnesota and finished, I think, five and six that year. So there's been some, one of the Rose Bowl years, Iowa lost to Minnesota. There's been L's against this team. Not recently, though, since Phil Fleck has taken over. Yeah, that's, and, and that's the other thing I'd stop by look into is a little, little history of Phil Fleck. And, and, you know, everybody knows he's 0-5 against Iowa, which, uh, like you said, uh, you know, before he got there, the Iowa-Minnesota rivalry was pretty darn, pretty darn even. They, they won a lot of games they, they shouldn't have. We won a few we shouldn't have, but, uh. You know some some wild some wild games over the years, but uh, since since Phil got there, it's been it's been all Iowa, and hopefully that that stays the same uh, on Saturday. You know these games uh, they have been some that you kind of wonder how did Iowa pull this out? It's kind of like Iowa football, and uh, that is way the way things have definitely broken down throughout the years. You know last year Minnesota ran the ball incredibly effectively, and short of a late play as Padilla hit Charlie Jones, two guys we will not see on the field on Saturday. You know, outside of that, it, it looked like Iowa could lose that game. But then late in the game, some of the decisions that Kirk made, yet ultimately Iowa found a way to get it done. What was it? Were they taking knees late in the game? I, I kind of conflate that one in the Penn State game, the end of the game, what they were doing there. No, Penn State was the one where he took the knee and, and punted. I, we got a late field goal, then we got the ball back. And, I, yeah, I think we we could have ran it out. And we, we, you know, so we – it's never, never good to talk about Iowa late game management. It's always, it's always <laughs> a, a, a debacle. But yeah, one of the things I'd, I'd stop by look at two things that comes to Phil Fleck because I know you, I know you hate him. I, mm-hmm. I dislike him. You hate him, probably stronger than I do. So I had him find a couple of good quotes just to show uh, how how big of a, a douchebag this guy has been. Just you know, it didn't just start when he got to Minnesota. He's always been that way. And then, yeah. and then we'll talk a little bit about why he's zero and five as well. But Stat Boy dug in, found some more newspaper articles. This is pre-Minnesota Phil Fleck years, and a couple funny things here. One, there was an article he found. He was a superstar athlete in a small town called Sugar Grove, Illinois, which uh, he's he's from there, and Don Beebe is from there. Oh, they're, wow. they're the two famous, yeah. So, but a uh, four-sports star there. They do an article about him um as he's graduating and getting ready to go to Northern Illinois to, to play football, but he was a four sports star. He'd won state long jump. And that's, that's in the articles right after that. And he made a comment. He quote in the article that, you know, he was talking about just how hard of a worker Phil Fleck is. And, and our, our friend goat will love this because it reminds me of his, his Macy daily obsession where Macy daily said he was getting up at you know eight in the morning and, and eight in the morning and grinding. So uh, Phil Fleck commented that, you know, after the state championship, he was up two days later, two two days later, up at six thirty in the morning, lifting and conditioning again. So wow, uh, that's pretty impressive. What a worker! <laughs> two two days later, you're just right back at it. And he commented that his plan was to continue to do that for several days a week, all summer long. So wow, whew, yeah. If you can, if you can get in the gym several days a week, that that's that's what separates Phil Fleck from the rest of us, Trent. So it, it goes back even to his high school days. He was pretty pretty proud of himself because he was. He was putting in that grind twice a week. So that he is such an unlikable figure. And I do respect him as a football coach. I mean, that that's the difference. There's been so many of these guys that come in that are just blathering idiots and they don't have anything behind it. Phil Fleck has something behind it. And I don't like the way that he recruits. I don't like his sideline demeanor. I don't like him as that, but he has built a football program. He has built Minnesota and, and made them a consistent winner. And now they're just waiting to get over the hump and, and what more needs to be done to get there. That's another question, but I do respect him as a football coach, just as a person. He is so unlikable. Here's one more for your, your unlikable uh, bin for him, Trent. So he gets hired after, if you remember that there are weird circumstances when he got hired, mm-hmm. Minnesota went nine and four. They just won a bowl game, but there was the big controversy over, how they handled some sexual assault charges. The players threatened to boycott the bowl. They ended up firing the coach. He comes in and during the press conference gets asked some questions about that controversy. And it's something, there's a comment about, you know, a difficult conversation to have as a, as a new coach. And his response to that conversation was, ah, 
I eat difficult conversations for breakfast, Trent. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> He's just the worst. Yeah, and that was his, that was his during his initial press conference. I eat difficult <laughs> conversations for breakfast. So. Oh wow! But uh, you know, and, and in that same press conference, he ended it by commenting, "When you watch Gopher football, I promise it will be different because I'm just different." So, mm. Yes, he is. Yeah, but uh, and you commented, "You're correct. He's made them a good program." But the one thing you can count on is uh, he may be doing well against everyone else, but he sure as heck ain't doing well against Iowa because. Uh, he talked about being different, and he's right. They, they were three and three against Iowa the six years before. They're zero and five since he got there. So uh, he's different, but not in a good way when it comes to Iowa. Oh, well, we'll make our picks on this game. We will break things down. Also, make our pick of the week: USC UCLA in the most beautiful uniform game of the season. We'll do that as we continue. Anything else on the matchup with the Gophers before that, Biz? No, and Statboy looked into the numbers. You 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 talked about it, Minnesota has out they they've played the way they want to play against us they beat us in time of possession four out of five years including last year they had the ball for 40 minutes but i think what the two problems fleck has had is a his own stubbornness they continue to run the ball no matter what they've fallen behind and they continue to run 2020 lost 35 to 7 and he still gave mo abraham the ball 34 times um so get off to a good start and you're in good shape because they are he is the most stubborn. I mean, we think Kurt Ferentz is stubborn. Phil takes it to another level. They're going to run the ball, run the ball, run the ball, no matter what. The other thing, amazingly, is that they've been unable to stop Iowa. We, uh, you know, the last four games against them, we scored 48, 23, 35, and 27. So uh, we've uh, we, we've had success, and they have they've been kind of the opposite of Minnesota, Minnesota or Wisconsin. I mean, Wisconsin we struggle with, and, and they have our number defensively for whatever reason. We 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 had some success moving the ball against Minnesota and will, will we have that success on Saturday? That's, that's the million dollar question. Well, we'll see who the quarterback is. Is it Tanner Morgan? Is it going to be a Calicamanis who has not been good under 50% completion percentage, three interceptions against one touchdown. Uh, let's see. It's young Athen out there as opposed to Tanner Morgan, who has done some things in the past against the Hawkeyes. We'll pick that game and a whole lot more as we continue here on the locked on Hawkeyes podcast. Today's episode brought to you by Bet Online, your number one source for sports information on the betting side of things, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there. Football, basketball, soccer with the World Cup around the corner, even esports, they have it all at Bet Online. And if you love sports podcasts, you'll find those as well at Bet Online. The latest and the fastest, easiest ways to get all your sports betting information and your sports betting fix. Head to the website today or hop on your phone to learn more. Bet online where the game starts. Trent Cotton, Jace Bisgard back with you one final time on the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Thanks for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen each and every day. All right, Biz, let's get into it here and make some picks for the week. Let's kick things off with the best game on the board USC, UCLA, and as I mentioned a little bit earlier, I love this game just because of the uniforms when they both wear their home uniforms, the baby blue of UCLA, the scarlet and yellow, gold, whatever they call it, garnet. I think garnet might be the color. Maybe that's Florida State. Regardless, it's a great uniform matchup. What Florida do you see State. here? UCLA, I, I, I called this one too, Arizona last week uh, on my <clears> radio <throat> show. We were talking about where's a potential upset that nobody sees. I had Arizona and uh, dab a little bit on that one on the money line. So that was a profitable one. I think UCLA bounces back, though, this week. I see them bouncing back. USC has been living on the edge with that defense all season long. And Dorian Tom Thompson Robinson, I don't see him playing poorly two weeks in a row. It's in the Rose Bowl here. I'm going to lay the point in half. Give me UCLA. Yeah, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I got no clue on this game. I mean, these two teams are so all over the board. The one thing I do know is that the Pac-12 is famous for – shooting themselves in the foot and destroying any uh, chances they have. And U USC still has a chance at the playoff. UCLA doesn't. So uh, for that reason alone, give me UCLA. The Pac-12 uh, tends to destroy it so every year. So I guess we agree, but I, I don't uh, have any confidence in the pick, but give me UCLA as well. All right, pick number two. We pick our favorite game of the week. What is your best bet on the board this week, Biz? Give me Oki State. I, mm. I just think both – Playing the rivalry game, it's one of the last times these two teams will maybe ever play each other. Uh, I just think 
right now, it, it's weird to say, but Mike Gundy, I think, is a significantly better coach than, than Venables is right now. Gundy, Gundy uh, will have them ready to play, and they're getting more than a touchdown. I don't know if they'll win, but I think this will be a close close game. And so uh, give me the Cowboys plus seven and a half. I'm going to grab Jim Mora Jr. and the UConn Huskies. Bull eligible. The bull, this the bull, was... ba- the bull bound UConn yeah. Huskies. Now, remember, they won a national championship back in 2020 as the New York Times handed them the national championship since they didn't play during 2020. But that aside, this has been a very, very poor program here. They're going to Army. Great landscape there. But getting 10 against a service academy team, this is going to be a great grinded out game. It'll probably be done in about two hours and 40 minutes. I'm going to jump aboard here. The Husky train. Give me UConn plus the 10 for my best bet of the week. And we wrap things up as we do every week with our pick on the Iowa game. Currently, the Hawkeyes are a a two-and-a-half-point underdog with an over-under of 32-and-a-half. I'm going to do a rarity here. I'm going to take a total, though I've been betting it all season long. Give me the under again. I I was talking to my friends at Circa. I asked them, where are you going to open this thing? I I thought they might go the lowest ever on the board in 29-and-a-half. They didn't. They opened it at 32-and-a-half, and and it sits right there. Give me the under. I think we're destined for 13-9 this week. I'm right, I'm right there with you, Trent, but my, my thought process is, is a little different than yours. I, my thought process is the exact same as last week. I, I really liked Iowa to beat Wisconsin last week, but as we talked about, I just didn't trust Brian Ferentz enough against Jim Leonard to, to make <laughs> that bet, and I said that the safe pick is the under. So same this week. I, I go into this week, same thing. I, I really like us to win this game. I, I, I think we're a better team than they are. I just I don't really understand – the love of Minnesota. You go back and look, they had a three game stretch where they got their butts kicked by Purdue. They got their butts kicked by Illinois and they got their butts kicked by Penn state. I mean, they had like 40 yards rushing against Purdue. Iowa ran the ball for 200 yards against Purdue. I mean, I, I just don't see what the love is for this Minnesota team. So I, I think Iowa wins the game, but I also, with Iowa's offense, nothing's ever, you know, I'm not overly confident everybody in Iowa to win a football game right now. Cause you got to score points to win games. But, uh, uh, the safe bet's the under. I think that's the way to go. So I'm right there with you. G- give me uh, under whatever that number is because, uh, you know, I think first team first team to double digits wins this game. Going to be an ugly one, a chilly one up there, a high of 17 currently forecast. I'll be there, in Trent. Yes, you're, you're going to go up there with your oldest and uh, enjoy a nice slushy grain belt while you're up there. That thing's right. going to be cold quickly. That's all right. There's no such thing as a bad premium grain belt, Trent. It's, it's premium for a reason. That's right. No doubt about it. Let's finish up here as we wrap up every week with Business Beat. Well, Business Beat is a uh, anniversary, Trent. Tomorrow is the 20-year anniversary of something you'll never see happen again. 20 years ago tomorrow, do you remember what happened in Iowa football? Uh, well, I would guess because we didn't play Thanksgiving week that year. It was the win uh, against Minnesota up in the roller dome, and we tore down the goalposts. We took the goalpost right out of the dome. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of stories going on. You know, Tennessee takes the goalposts out and they wander around town and it's a great story. But uh, I can't imagine it's ever going to happen again where you walk into your your rival and, and tear down the opposing goalposts. So uh, 20 years tomorrow, Trent, it's, uh, it's something that, uh, you know, we're, if we win on Saturday, we're not tearing the goalposts down. But, right. uh, you know. Let, let's let's go and win and uh, at least keep the tr- keep the tradition of winning up in Minnesota alive. So uh, a pretty great uh, pour out a green belt and, and celebrate the 20 year anniversary of something you'll, you'll never see again. So that was a good happy, happy anniversary to tearing down the uh, tearing down the goalposts and walking them right outside the, the old uh, Homer Dome. We were uh, one of the first people on the field after that game. Uh, my buddy Will Lack, of course, was a walk-on. We've talked about that in the past. And I asked him, hey, can we hop down there? And he's like, yeah, I think so. And so me, Cousin Chuck, uh, the Ricks boys, we were in the front row. We hopped down on the field. And then we saw a flood of people also coming with us. And then we just sprinted to the middle, uh, got people laid out from the police that were first starting to try to knock some people down. That's a story, in fact, I might have to tell later this week because it was a fun one. Chuck got to be on TV later that night. Uh, my cousin from the other side of the family said, what's what's wrong with your cousin? Well, he maybe had a case of beer before that one. But quite a day, 20-year anniversary tomorrow. 
I, I think that's going to be part of tomorrow's podcast. Biz, it's been fun this week and appreciate you as always. Enjoy Minnesota, bring home a victory, and make sure Floyd comes back with you. Go Hawks. <laughs>